You're listening to EcoShock Radio for the world. I'm Alex Smith. Get it all at our website, ecoshock.org. When it comes to your food, it's all about moisture in the soil when crops need it. That is changing as the earth warms, according to new science published in the journal Nature. When we load up the atmosphere with carbon-based power, we get more drought and worse floods. Our guest is the lead author of the new study. Dr. Kate Marvel is with Columbia University and an associate research scientist at the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies. Following her Ph.D. in physics at Cambridge, Kate investigated climate and energy at top research institutions like Stanford, Carnegie, and Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Kate is a communicator on various science shows and has a regular column, Hot Planet, in Scientific American. From New York City, Kate Marvel, welcome to Radio EcoShock. Thank you so much for having me. Well, please tell us the title of your new paper published in Nature on May 1st, 2019. The title is 20th Century Hydroclimate Changes Consistent with Human Influence. What is the basic question your team sought to investigate? I think the most basic question we wanted to look at was, what does the past tell us about the present and the future? So we are really fortunate to have tree ring-based records of past drought conditions, thousands and thousands of trees. Um, And you can look at the width of their rings, um, and that tells you something about how dry or how moist the soil was during that year when they were growing. So we have thousands of those records, and they've been aggregated into data sets called drought atlases. And we wanted to see what those drought atlases could tell us about drought in the past and, and drought now. I was surprised that you found signals of global climate change so early. I mean, the oil age had barely begun in the year 1900. How could the visible effect of burning coal start so early? Were emissions really that high in the late 1800s? Um, emissions weren't that high. So it was it was actually interesting that we, we did find this increasingly resemblance. I think the thing to note is that we were looking at trends across a wide swath of the global land area over a really long time period. So it's not that unusual for California to get dry, and it's not that unusual for the Mediterranean to get dry, and it's not unusual for Australia to get dry. But it is unusual for all three regions to show even a very slight drying trend over a really long time. So what we're doing in this paper is we're looking at that big picture and we're looking over the really long time scales that these tree ring-based reconstructions provide us with. And I've been thinking about the delay of heat from the time of emissions. It's, it's calculated to be somewhere between 20 and 60 years due to thermal inertia of the oceans. And I wonder if that delay affects the results of your paper at all or change the picture. I mean, we're using models that are coupled together. So the models that we're using to understand and compare to the observations have the influence of the ocean. Um, They have the influence of the atmosphere, and they have that coupling between the atmosphere and the ocean. You know, I I, I think we're, we're very careful not to say this is definitely human emissions and this is definitely a really large effect. What we're saying is we see a trend where the observations increasingly resemble what we expect greenhouse gases to do, and they resemble it more than they ever have in the past. And we have tree ring reconstructions that let us estimate the past going back to, to 1400. And your paper raises an important new concept for all of us, or at least it was fairly new to me, and that is hydroclimate. What is hydroclimate? So we would define hydroclimate as all aspects of the climate that affect the hydrological cycle, the cycling of of water through the ocean and the atmosphere. What we look at here is something called the Palmer Drought Severity Index, which is a proxy measurement for soil moisture. A lot of people think that drought is is just a function of rainfall, right? They think that when it doesn't rain, you get a drought. When it does rain, the drought's over. But drought's affected by other variables as well. Drought can be affected by rising temperatures, changes in wind speed. And so looking at soil moisture or a proxy for soil moisture kind of lets us look at the influence of of climate change and anthropogenic emissions on soil moisture. And we're told that 
For every one degree C of warming, Earth's atmosphere can hold an additional 7% of water vapor. And I'm wondering, where does that extra water into the sky come from? Is some of it sucked out of the land and therefore drought? Yeah, so evaporation, you're absolutely right that evaporation increases with temperature. I mean, the way I kind of like to think of it is is a warmer sky is a thirstier sky. So we definitely expect increases in what we call evaporative demand. Now, the vast majority of the water in the atmosphere comes from the oceans, which from the perspective of the atmosphere are are basically a bottomless source of, of water availability. Over land, we know that it's not a bottomless source. We know that evaporation really, really matters over land, and the ocean doesn't miss uh, a little bit more water that's been evaporated from it, but the land very much does. And isn't water vapor itself a greenhouse gas? I mean, if there's more water vapor up there as we heat up, is that an instance of warming begetting more warming? Absolutely. So the water vapor feedback is an example of a feedback that we understand fairly well. We know that warm air holds more water vapor, and we know that You put carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you warm up the air, it holds more water vapor. Water vapor itself is a greenhouse gas. So that's an instance of something that scientists call, and I I think this is the worst terminology we ever could have come up with, um, we call it positive feedback. Because normal people hear positive feedback and they think that means I'm doing a great job. But uh, when scientists say positive feedback, we mean something that's really destabilizing, something that can, can add to the warming. And the strange part of this for me, Kate, is if there's more water in the atmosphere, why would large parts of the world continue to get drier? Well, I mean, you have a balance, right? We have a balance between rainfall, increases in rainfalls, and we do expect there to be an increase in heavy precipitation events in the future. But at the same time, you do have that increase in, in evaporative demand. So it's, all, it's a very complicated picture because you have shifts in rainfall patterns where you expect On on a very large scale, wet areas to get wetter and dry areas to get drier. But you also have shifts in rainfall patterns because we expect the atmospheric circulation is changing as the temperature gradient between the the tropics and the poles flattens. So we expect changes in the large-scale motion of, of air in the atmosphere, and that can really affect where it rains and how much it rains. And again, you know, drought is is not just about rainfall. Drought's um, about temperature and wind speed and other things as well. Something that we don't explicitly address in this paper, but is going to be really important going forward, is to what extent changes in the land surface can really accelerate or, or slow down the emergence of these drought signals. As we go forward into the future, we expect changes in the land surface to matter as well. And so uh, there, there have been a lot of really smart scientists. Abby Swan at the University of Washington has been a real leader in this, pointing out that plants are affected by carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We expect um, the CO2 fertilization effect to make more plants to lead to, to greening in some places. We also expect that it makes plants more efficient at using water. So that greater efficiency which means plants don't dry out the land as much, could be counteracted by the fact that there's more plants. But then, again, it's, it's hard to use water efficiently when you're on fire. So we don't know how plants are going to respond to increased heat stress, increased wildfires, um, and just general rising temperatures. So looking forward into the future, I think there's still, there's still a lot of science to be done. There's still a lot of, of things that we have yet to understand. Could you tell us a little bit more about those tree ring atlases that help scientists cross-check the climate models against measurements in the real world? Sure. This is why um, science is a really collaborative process. I had never worked with tree rings before. Um, I was vaguely aware of their existence, but my collaborator and the co-author on this paper is a real leader in using tree ring-based data sets to understand past climates. So everything I know about tree rings, I, I learned from him and from reading the references that he pointed me to. So big, big thank you to Ben Cook for this. So I, this, is, this is not really an expert perspective, but tree rings give you an estimate of the climate during their growing season. So, you know, if they are are nice and thick, you can infer that the soil was fairly moist, they had lots of room, lots of ability to grow that year. And if they're thin, you can infer that was dry year. These drought atlases are the result of thousands and thousands of, of tree ring measurements collated together to make sure that they're giving a consistent picture. 
And the great thing about them is anybody is, is free to download them and, and play with them. And I think that's just an amazing triumph of kind of scientific openness. Why was the time from around 1950 to 1975 harder to read for those climate signals than the period before and after? That's a great question. So we know that in about the 1950s, we start getting an increase in what atmospheric scientists call aerosols. And this can be really confusing because a lot of people think aerosols mean spray cans. But the way we use that word in atmospheric science is we mean we mean basically crud in the atmosphere, as somebody put it to me earlier today. We mean soot, we mean dust, we mean particulates, we mean pollution. And in the 1950s, we see a, a major increase in in the emission of those you know, kind of what we think of as pollutants. And those have a fairly powerful effect on the climate because they block sunlight. And if you block sunlight and less sun reaches the the planet's surface, then that has a cooling effect. Now, we're not 100% sure exactly how strong that cooling effect was because we don't know exactly what the emissions were. We don't know exactly what got emitted where. We don't know um, what their effect was on clouds, and we don't know to what extent seeding clouds made them more effective at, at blocking sunlight. But we know the general direction that things should have gone in, and we expect that this increase in aerosol forcing or this increase in aerosol emissions would have a, a cooling effect and would have kind of a counteracting effect to, to greenhouse gases. According to the Union of Concerned Scientists, almost half of all the industrial greenhouse gas pollution has gone into the sky since 1988. Why do you think the hydroclimate signal is still harder to read in the 2000s than it was in the days of early industrialization? Yeah, that's the big question, um, and that's something that we really struggled with. What I think is happening is... is I think there's three explanations, and the answer is probably a combination of all three and probably something else. So first, I would say we're talking about signals emerging from noise, and noise decreases with time. It's a lot more unusual to have something going on for half a century than it is to have it going on for a couple decades. So the first is, I think, the noise is larger. But I think the second uh, possible explanation is the residual role of aerosols. Aerosols have been cleaned up since the the 70s, since the Clean Air Act and other environmental legislation in the 70s, but they're not gone. They're still there in the atmosphere, and they could still be having an effect. But the third reason is we know that we have lived through a period of kind of strange climate conditions. From about 1998 to 2013, the climate conditions were characterized by kind of cool anomalies, you know, cool temperatures um, in the tropical Pacific Ocean. And we're not 100% sure what caused that. It's, it's definitely consistent with just a mode of natural climate variability. But the upshot of that is that those cool conditions led to formation of low clouds and resulted in warming that was not as great as perhaps it could have been. Whatever was causing that, it seems to be over now. Um, We had really large El Ninos in uh, warm waters in the the Pacific in 2013. 15 and 2016. And whatever characterized that, that hiatus, or some disingenuous people called it a pause in, in global warming, whatever caused that seems to be over now. But that could have had an effect as well. Big Picture Radio right now with Alex Smith. Get it all, ecoshock.org. This is Radio Ecoshock. I'm Alex Smith with my guest, Dr. Kate Marvel from Columbia University and the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies. You can check out her website at marvelclimate.com. Let's talk about some regional projections from the climate models. Why are the Mediterranean countries in Europe expected to dry out more than other parts of the world? 
Well, regional projections are are dependent on changes in the atmospheric circulation, you know, that large-scale motion of, of air and water in the atmosphere, and also the, the temperature increases. So all of the models basically agree that we should see drying in the Mediterranean. Um, and my co-author, Ben Cook, has, has done a lot of pioneering research showing that there is a really consistent and robust expectation of drying in, um, in the southwestern U.S. and Mexico. So I think we should expect drier conditions in those places. When we will see a unambiguous signal in those particular regions, I would expect we would have to wait a very long time. And that's because internal variability, natural, you know, just natural climate variability is large on a regional scale. It's only when you really zoom out and look at that global picture that you see a a tractable signal emerging. And I see that the models are projecting a continued drought in the U.S. southwest. That is understandable. But I'm wondering, do we know what's going to happen in the key wheat and corn agricultural areas of the U.S. Midwest that help feed America and a lot of the world, really? That's probably a question for my colleagues here at NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies who run something called the Agricultural Model Intercomparison Project, where they're really trying to break down the influence of of climate change and changes in all of these different variables on crops. So I would would defer that question to people with expertise in crop modeling. Okay, I'll dig that up and see if I can put a link (laughs) in my blog for it for our listeners. And can you talk about what the projections for the soil moisture or the rainfall in India will be and what challenges may come out of that? So India is is very interesting because in India, the monsoon is of paramount importance. And understanding how climate change will affect the monsoon is still an area of really, really active study. In India, we have really large emission of aerosols, so we expect them to have a pretty large effect. But then we also have a a greenhouse gas effect on the monsoon, which is is still an area of of really active study. We also expect a pretty big impact in South Asia of irrigation, of the fact that we're seeing really large-scale changes to the land surface as a result of of large-scale irrigation. We expect that would affect the climate as well. So those projections on on that regional scale are are still fairly to be studied, I think. But India might become wetter rather than drier. It might, depending on on how greenhouse gases affect the monsoon. Right. Okay. Now, Africa is one of the largest continents. It's got a rapidly growing population. Why isn't Africa really covered in this study? Because there is no drought atlas for, for Africa. Okay. And why is that? It has to do with field data availability um, and the type of tree and the uh, community's efforts to collect that data. But that's a question for a dendrochronologist to answer. Well, I hope we'll develop that because I think it's important. Now, I recently spoke with David Keelings from the University of Alabama about super hurricanes, and he told us climate change does not cause hurricanes, but once those great storms are born, then climate change can make them stronger. Is it the same case with drought? I mean, it, certainly climate change, droughts would happen without climate change. And any one individual event, it's, it's going to be very, very difficult to say, unless the event is so extreme, it's going to be very difficult to say this particular event would not have occurred without climate change. What you can do is flip the script and say, how did climate change affect this event? How did climate change make this particular event worse? Or how did it make it more likely? And so we expect that as temperatures rise, evaporative demand will increase. We expect as temperatures rise, rainfall patterns will shift. But if, if you want to sort of get, a, if you want to meet the very, very high bar of would this particular event have been extremely unlikely or impossible without climate change. I think you really have to look at long-term trends over really large areas. I know that scientists reported Australia was actually drier before the arrival of the European settlers, and then those settlers kind of lucked out when they experienced a, a wet cycle that lasted for a couple of centuries. It was good for agriculture. Now the farming area there is shrinking 
So I'm wondering how we know that the drying trends recorded in the tree rings are not also just part of a long hydrological cycle rather than really a result of climate change. I mean, that's I mean, that's a good question. It kind of gets to using tree rings as a way to estimate variability before the Industrial Revolution. We can say that on a, on a large scale, the things that we see, these, this increasing resemblance to this fingerprint, that is stronger than it has ever been in the centuries of hydroclimate change that are recorded by tree rings. And we can say that, well, this is, this is consistent with what we expect greenhouse gases to do. There's an old saying, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, and scientists seem to be saying something similar, like the dry get drier and the wet get wetter. What is the underlying process that accentuates this difference as we heat up the atmosphere and the oceans? Well, we expect, um, as you noted, warmer air holds more water vapor. And we also expect that that water vapor gets there because of increased evaporation, increased evaporative demand from a warming atmosphere. In, I think, 2006, two scientists, Isaac Held and Brian Soden, published a paper that's been very influential, where they basically argued that in the absence of any major changes to any, anything else, this pattern will result in wet areas getting wetter and dry areas getting drier. Now, we don't expect this to be happening in the absence of other changes, and we think those other changes to things like, you know, the atmospheric dynamics will be significant. In a press release from Columbia University, you said all the models are projecting that you should see unprecedented drying soon in a lot of places. It almost sounds like there's a delay in that hydroclimate, like pent-up effects that we might see in the next 10 years or so. Is that what you're thinking? I wouldn't put it as pent-up effects, but I would say a climate signal even a really strong signal is always occurring against a backdrop of natural variability. And so climate change detection and attribution is, is, is a signal to noise process. It's, it's finding a signal, if it's there, against a backdrop of of internal variability against the backdrop of noise. And that noise is, to some extent, fundamentally unpredictable. You know, I'm not going to be able to tell you if there's going to be a big El Nino in the year 2030. Um, I'm not going to be able to tell you when different modes of different oscillations of the climate system are going to combine in a particular way. So we, there's always going to be noise inherent in the system. But what the models are saying is that, again, on this really, really large scale and against, you know, over a really, really long term period, we should be able to see something that is significant against that noise backdrop by the middle of this century. You sound like someone who enjoys science. What are some of the themes that you like to mess around with? I love my job because I feel like I learn something new every day. I love the fact that no one person can understand everything about the climate system, about this unbelievable planet we live on. So I find myself very often working on problems where I have to work with oceanographers, I have to work with statisticians, I have to work with physicists, I have to work with land surface modelers. And I love that. I love feeling like I get to learn something new all the time. Are you finding more younger women coming up in science than there were before? It used to be sort of a chorus of male voices on this show, and now it's becoming more and more uh, women scientists, and I love that. Um, I think the Columbia Earth and Environmental Sciences graduate program this year, all of the admitted students were women. So I I think that's great. Um, I think we still have a lot more work to do, and we need to do this, with increasing the diversity, especially the racial diversity of earth sciences. We've been speaking with Dr. Kate Marvel from Columbia University and the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies. She's the lead author of a new paper in the journal Nature and talking about climate change starting as early 1900, showing up in the signals. You can find links to this science discussed in my Radio EcoShock blog at ecoshock.org. Kate, thank you so much for getting out here and sharing the science. Thank you so much. Check out the Radio EcoShock website. We're at ecoshock.org. My thanks to all my email correspondents. 
I could not do this program without your tips and support. Thank you for listening again this week and caring about our world. 